fine. How was the weekend? Woo! Good? Woo! Good. Yeah? Oh, wow. Yeah? Really good. Oh, good. 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 Anybody do anything fun? Yeah. What'd you do? What's our wedding? Oh, who's? Great Sims, my old high school roommate. And I wore my book for a year in high school buddy. Okay, okay, gotcha. Oh, that's awesome. Anybody else have any fun? Yeah? Beat Caleb and Andrew. Oh, yeah, that is true. Yeah, he did beat me and Jam. Yeah, we did. We had a fun party yesterday. Sam was going away party. So if you see a lot of tears from people today, that's just because the message was so moving. <laughs> so don't. Don't get confused about that. Uh, yeah, no, it's a big day um, for that, and, and it's been a good weekend overall, I think. So, um, and it's not over. Yeah, I, I, you know, I just started this job in June, um, working for Student Life, and it's my first like real, real Monday to Friday, eight to five or seven thirty, four thirty um, job. And I used to make fun of customers when I worked at Starbucks, who were like Monday through Friday customers, because they just talked about the weekend like it was. This free, like freedom, like chain breaking kind of thing, and I was just like, get, get over yourself. You know what I mean? Like, it's not that big of a deal. And now the countdown is on. And, like Monday, when when it's Friday, it's the most exciting thing. I was just talking to Andrew and Andy about this yesterday, but it's like, ah! I don't have to go to bed like early. I don't have to wake up early. I get tomorrow and the next day. So it's. Yeah, the weekends are great, so I'm, but, but it does, around Saturday night, I also feel the pressure of the clock ticking on the weekend. You know what I mean? It's like, oh man, it's only a day left, so we should try to work in some good stuff today so we can really stretch it out. Also, the summer's almost over, which is crazy, yeah? So, yes, you know, we'll talk about this in announcement time, but next week is like our prayer Sunday for the fall because everybody gets back here in two weeks. Whoa, crazy, yeah. Sometimes I feel more ready for that than others. I'll be honest with you, I'm not, I'm not there yet right now. I mean, I'm excited for it, but it's just like, whew, wow, it's coming fast. You know, it's going to be busy around here. But it's like, I love the summer because it is like a tight knit time. Um, but you know that we have a, we have a real mission here on the campus to, to gather people to Christ, to equip them and to send them out. Um, and we get to start a new cycle and continue older cycles of that in just two weeks. So um, it is a really exciting thing. Uh, so. Get rested, because you got you got a lot of a lot of stuff coming. It's gonna be great. All right. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna do a little bit, not too much, but just more than normal. It's like kind of a sermon no no if you're not familiar with this, especially on a morning to like ask for input a lot, you know, because then you just get like one person responding about what they did and no one else really does, but and Ed's shaking his head no at me. But today I'm gonna break the rules. So sorry. Yep, suck it up. So uh, I'm gonna. Um, there's just a few times where I'm gonna need some things from you. So I feel like it would be good to like start with maybe a warm up this morning. Okay. So even if you are not normally a participator, like you know, like in your head you're like, okay, but I'm not gonna say a thing. I'm talking to you. Okay. So I, I just, you know, let's just start with some easy ones right here. Okay. For example, how about everyone name a color? Blue. 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 Who's not saying a color? I want to hear it. Gray. Okay, thanks, purple. That sounds good. Thank you, thanks. All right, that was good. See, that was easy. All right, this one's going to take a little, this one takes a little bit more thought, so we're going to work it up in stages. So, where is a good place to get a slice of pizza? Okay, good job everyone. Give yourselves a hand. You did it. You can participate. 
participate, and you will participate. Right? That's good. Good job, okay? Okay, so we've been talking about Joseph, right? Uh, for the last whole, this whole summer, we've been talking about the book of Genesis. Um, and today, wraps it up. We're even going to read something from chapter 50, which is the last chapter of Genesis. Okay, so it's really, we're just wrapping the whole thing. Real nice bow, okay? But we've been, for the last few weeks, we've been talking about Joseph. And um, today is the very end of his story. Okay, so that's what we're going to discuss. But I thought it would be helpful because not everyone's been here every week. I haven't even been here every week, so you can help fill me in. Um, if we could maybe just together recap a little bit of what, what Joseph is has uh, gone through, and it will be helpful for later points in my sermon if you would participate, okay? So it's good for every, it's a win-win, all right? So uh, if we're thinking about facts that have happened in Joseph's life, and we'll try to go as chronologically as possible, okay? It doesn't have to be perfect, but just, you know, don't throw me something out there about Pharaoh at the beginning, if you know what I'm saying, okay? So tell me some things that happened, and you can do it. You did the colors, the pizza, even the news, all right? You can do it. Joseph was born. Good job. Good job. Okay, born to who? Jacob. Hey, all right. Okay. Then what happened? He was born what? Something else. Some other fact. He was Jacob's favorite. He was Jacob's favorite. Yep. Okay, good. He was his, he was his dad's favorite kiddo. He, he was the, yeah, oh, at the time, yeah. yeah. He was the youngest when he was born. Absolutely. He was a brat. Of course, everyone was the <laughs> But he was, he was the youngest for a long time. Okay. That, that dad on the came along. Okay. What else? He was a brat. He was a brat? Yep. Okay, good. Okay, we know that he was a little, maybe a little entitled, maybe a little fool of himself. I heard something about a coat and a dream. So a Technicolor dream coat. He had a Technicolor slash maybe a long sleeves coat. Just depends on which translation you're reading. Mine or any other translation. Okay, good. No, that's good. Okay, and then what about a dream? Someone said a dream? Something about it, anyway, was it just Chinese food the night before, and what is it? Basically, dream it. He, he had a dream that he would rule over his brothers. It was symbolic, right? But he's like, you you know, you guys had some stuff growing up, and my stuff growing up, and then yours bowed down mine. How crazy is that? Yeah. And then there was another one about the stars. Okay, so we have the dreams, all right? So it looks like things are going well for Joseph. Something else happened. Oh, Snapple. Yes, his brother sold him into human trafficking. Yep, and he went into... Egypt, Egypt yep. Yeah. And where was he sold to? Oh, you guys are doing so well. See, this can be done. <laughs> okay, good. He was sold. He was sold to Potiphar, and then what happened? He w he was pretty cut, so his wife liked him. Okay, yeah, he was swole. We know that he was swole. Yeah, he looked good. And then Potiphar's wife started started macking on him. Yeah, and then oh, sorry. Also, he was awesome, and he. Practice God's presence and stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you did. Yeah, we do know that. Good point, Chris. We don't want to miss that. Okay, and then, okay, she was flirting with him, and then what happened? Accused him. Accused him? Framed? Sent to prison. Sent to prison. Okay, wow, we are really getting there. All right, we're almost home. What happened? Other facts. Say it again. He interpreted the baker's dream. He interpreted, yeah, the baker's, and I think it was a cupbearer. Yeah. Yep, he interpreted the baker and the cupbearer dream. Okay, and then basically one was supposed to do really well, and the other one was... Right? And he said, what did he tell the other guy? Remember me. Oh, you guys are so great. Yeah. Remember me. Yeah, that's right. Is that Mark Schultz? Is that right? I think so. <laughs> no, that doesn't need to happen out loud. All right. Uh, he said, remember me, and then what else happened? He didn't remember. He, he was forgotten. Yeah, he was in jail. And then, we're almost done. You guys got it. Two years later, he was Two years later, Pharaoh had a dream. He asked, he was remembered because he asked, was it the cupbearer that lived, right? The baker died, the cupbearer lived. Right, so the cupbearer said, oh, I remember this guy. And then, yeah, he tells him the dream. Okay, good. The dream, if you remember, it was a, it, basically it came down to this. Two dreams, they're really the same dream. There's going to be seven, was it seven? Seven good years of plenty, years of plenty. Seven years of plenty. And then seven years of famine. They were going to be like the worst famine that has ever been seen. It's not just going to be in Egypt, it's going to be everywhere. Okay, and so the Pharaoh said, we should, Joseph said, I think here's what you should do. You should appoint somebody to, like, manage over all of this. So in the plenty, you can save up, and the famine, you can shell out, you know, um, just to make it rain, rain out there. All right, we'll give it for you economically. And then uh, what happened was Pharaoh appointed Joseph. Okay, so this is, this is where we left off. You did it. Once more, give yourself a hand. That was great. Good job, everybody. Yep, yep. I believe. Okay, 
So there's actually several chapters to get caught up on with what happens at the end of Joseph's story because I really want to focus just on like the the end and of the story, the high moment in, in narrative. You would you know you refer to this as like the peak moment, the climax of the story. That's really what I want to get to. But uh, we have to go through a couple chapters first. Um, so I'm just gonna we're not gonna read them, but I'm gonna kind of summarize what happens. Okay. So I'll do the fact sharing now. Basically, this is what it looks like. Okay. So the famine happened. Those seven years of plenty happened, they were great, okay, then the famine happened, and people started suffering and struggling. One of those people was Jacob and his sons, if you remember, this is Joseph's family, right, all the way back, not in Egypt, okay, so they started struggling, and basically Jacob says he heard that there was grain in Egypt, he said to his sons, why are you staring blankly at each other, I just heard that there's grain in Egypt, go down there and buy some of that for us so that we can survive and not starve to death, okay, so now everyone can start to see the story, you know, a little foreshadowing of what's going to happen, okay, so... They go down to Egypt, and then they're sent to Joseph. They say, this is the guy, although I don't think he was called Joseph at the time or whatever. They say, this is the guy you can talk to. And when they saw him, it says, when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him. Whoa, prophecy fulfilled. That's pretty crazy, huh? Looks like the dream was actually true. Hate it when the punks are right. Uh, their faces to the ground. When Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, um, but he acted like he didn't know them. They did not recognize him. Okay, so then... This kind of long, drawn-out thing happens where Joseph kind of is testing them out. He's trying to see what they're at. And also, I think there's probably just a lot happening in his heart at that time. Because you can imagine the last time he saw these guys was when he was begging them not to sell them into slavery. And they sold them into slavery. Okay, so um, basically, he goes through this thing. He finds out that there's another brother from his, from his mother. Um, and he says, uh, basically, you know, you guys are spies. I think you're spies. They're like, no, we're not spies. We promise. He said, I think you're spies. I think you're the whole thing's a lie. And he says, if you want to prove it, go back and get your youngest son, you know, and bring him, bring him to me. Or your youngest brother, bring him to me, and then I'll go with you. And they're like, you've got to understand, like, our dad will flip a lid. Like, he'll die. He'll actually die if, we, if, we, if something happens, but we can't do that. He says, I'm not going to trust you until you go. You keep one of your brothers here, and, and you go get your youngest, your youngest brother, bring him back, and I'll believe you. So they leave Judah, Judah like volunteers. Big step for Judah, especially when you think about his hand and the messy betrayal uh, stuff that happened earlier. So he's grown up a little bit. And he says, I'll, I'll volunteer, I'll stay as prisoner, and then you guys go. So they go back home, and they tell Jacob, their dad, they say, here's the deal. Uh, the guy that we went to go get grain from, he accused us of being spies, and we basically need to bring our brother back. But here's, here's the, the sticky situation. Is we, sold, we, we bought the grain with silver, and when we came back, we had the grain and the silver was in our bags. So we didn't do that, but it looks like we robbed the place. Now Joseph did that, P.S. Yeah, he's kind of still a punk a little bit, honestly. But I don't, I don't know, I think he's trying to test them, whatever. So it, basically, if they go back, they think they're going to be accused of robbing Pharaoh. Um, but if they don't go back, they'll never see Judah. And Jacob's like, well, Benjamin's my favorite now, so... Guess that's how it's going to be, you know. So they don't. He doesn't really question sending them back. But then they run out of grain again, and so they're like, "You have to go back and get us more grain." And they say, "We can't go unless we take Benjamin." He's like, "I'll die if you take Benjamin. I'll actually die." And they say, "No, we got to do it." So they take Benjamin back. It's a big mess, and again, Joseph does the same thing to them. He sends them back, but he plants money, and this time he plants his cup. Now I have a favorite cup at home. It's a little blue mug. Uh, but I think, and I, I really do cherish it if it ever broke out, I'd be pretty disappointed. But this is beyond like a favorite cup thing. I think there's something, I, I, I'm not an expert in Near Eastern and ancient culture, but I think there was something special about the cup. Uh, like it was, it was kind of used for like prophecy and statement making. So anyways, this cup is missing, and Joseph planted it in Benjamin's back. So he catches up with him. I know this is a lot, I'm sorry, but it's just, it's the story. Okay, so Joseph catches up with him, and he says basically, hey, like, my cup is gone. Uh, and, and where is it? And they say, oh, no, 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 it wasn't us. It wasn't us. We wouldn't do it. Whoever has a cup, they can be you. you know, we'll all, if you find a cup in one of our bags, we'll be your slaves for life. And he says, no, 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 I'm, a, I'm not a hard man. I'll just take the one who's, who's got the cup in their bag. And everyone lowers the bag, and then the youngest son, Benjamin, has it. And this, the, the brothers just fall to pieces. And they're like, we can't. We cannot. I don't, this didn't happen. I don't know how this happened. But if you take him, our family's ruined. You know, basically, our dad will die. You'll send him to grave in his grief. We'll be marked forever by this. There's no good ending for our family. And that is what basically triggers Joseph. Like he can't, he just can't keep it in anymore. 
There's been lots of little times throughout the story where he's like, excuse me, and he has to leave and go cry and come back. But this is the, this is the time where he, he finally lets it out. Okay, so I know that's a little messy, but it's like four chapters I just had to summarize. So does everybody feel like we're, we're understanding what's happened a little bit? I got a thumbs up in the back. That's all clear, Kraft, all clear. All right, okay, so we're going to start reading now in Genesis 45. And, and we are going to see kind of what happened. Right, and I think it's going to be up on the screen too. Yep, here's what it says. Joseph could no longer control himself in front of all his attendants, so he declared, Everyone leave now. So no one stayed with him when he was revealed, when he revealed his identities to his brethren. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians and Pharaoh's household heard him. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father really still alive? His brothers couldn't respond because they were terrified before him. Joseph said to his brothers, Come closer to me. And they moved closer. He said, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold to Egypt. Now don't be upset and don't be angry with yourselves that you sold me here. Actually, God sent me before you to save lives. We've already had two years of famine in the land, and there are going to be five more years left without planting or harvesting. God sent me before you to make sure you'd survive and to rescue your lives in this amazing way. You didn't send me here. It was God who made me a father to Pharaoh, master of the entire household, and ruler of the whole land of Egypt. Hurry, go back to your father, tell him that this is what Joseph says. And basically, he says, God has made me master of all Egypt. Come down to me and don't delay. And then he asks them to bring their family back. So he reveals himself, and, and he says some pretty remarkable things, which I want to look at. I, I really want to center in today on how, how did Joseph, how was he able to really make this turning point? How was he able to respond to the circumstances of his life in such a way that he offered praise to God through it instead of hatred towards his brother from it? Um, and, and what, how could that really apply to us? Okay, so the very you have three points, and I'll I'll tell you up front right now that point one is going to be like our our foundation, and point two and three are like how does this work? Um, but but we'll explain that more as we go. All right, so point one is this: Joseph viewed his life through a bigger lens. Joseph viewed his life through a bigger lens. And we see that a little bit. He says, you know, it wasn't you know. You didn't send me here. Actually, God sent me here to save your, your lives. He viewed his life through a bigger lens. And here's what I mean about this, okay? Um, and, and states, yeah, I'm going to take a drink of water, sorry. Great, that's much better. Okay, each of us have basically an ability or an option to make meaning of our circumstances. Each of us can assign a story to the facts of our lives. That's something that we do naturally. That's something that we do rarely without thinking about it, okay? And uh, I'm, I, I brought an illustration today. We're going to use a marker board. I'm pretty excited about it. Okay, I don't know how it's going to go, but we'll find out together. All right. So what I'm, what I'm saying, when I say lens, this is what I mean, that each of us has an opportunity to make meaning or make uh, a story out of our circumstances or our facts. Okay? So another, another thing I'm going to need your help with, we're going to play a game. It's like kind of connect the dots. I'm going to start drawing a, an object or a shape or something, and you tell me what it is. Why? A line. Oh, thanks. Who said that? Good job, Alex. Okay. And and now? A longer line. A longer line. Okay, great. Maybe it's a longer line. What is it now? Oh, whoa. Wait, I heard a couple things there. Somebody said what? Triangle. Triangle. But then someone else said maybe a rectangle. Yeah, okay, so there's a couple options you have there, right? Because you don't have all the information you need, and our brain automatically works this way, even with dots, is we see things and then we kind of fill in the rest of the story. But, but you have an option. You know, we have, we have differences in, in what kind of stories we tell. Now, I think this transfers over to facts. For example, in the news situation when people told me some stories, some things said, oh, I've heard a lot about Donald Trump, I've heard a lot, a lot about the New Theory deal, I've heard a lot about the debates, okay? And Andy and I were just talking about this. If you look up who won, if you didn't know, the GOP, the, uh, the Republican Party, had their first primary debate, okay? On Fox News Network, it was a big deal. If you didn't have cable, you couldn't watch it unless you illegally streamed it from your own news, what up? Yeah, so uh, anyways, okay? Uh, if you look up who won the debate, who won last week's debate, who won Thursday night's debate, you could find a plethora. You could find someone saying every name, probably, except for maybe Rand Paul. You can find just about anyone okay, that says that they won the debate. But everyone watched the same thing. Okay? Everybody watched the same set of facts. They just assigned different meanings to it. Um, and that's, that's just something that happens. Has anybody ever been in a situation where you saw something and someone else saw the same thing, and yet you're saying completely different stories about what happened? 
you know, it's a lot of times just happens in a fight or an argument, right? Uh, I, I, this can happen sometimes when people get in a wreck, right? And they, they, they tell, you were both involved, but you tell very different stories about what happened. You know, I, I think it'd be fun sometimes to be a cop and walk around with this person and ask what happened. They walk over there and see what happened with this person. A lot of times those stories don't match up at all. Uh, and there's because there's some selfish motives in there, but we have an ability to look at the facts and circumstances and assign meaning to it. Now, we do this with our own life as well. Not just in conversations or in political dialogue, but when we think about the facts of our lives, okay, we and the circumstances that happen or happen to us, uh, we assign a story to them. We, we make meaning out of them just naturally. Okay, and, and Joseph, I, I just want to make the point basically that when, when he told this story about his life, he told it from a big God-centered perspective. Okay, so thinking about some of the facts of his life, okay, is Joseph, I mean, he, he was sold into slavery, right? He worked for Potiphar, he worked his way up, uh, and then he was betrayed there, he went to prison, like we said, right? And then he worked his way up there, pretty much. I mean, you know, he, he definitely was with God, and, and God blessed him, but, but maybe he could have told that story differently, you know? Maybe he could have told that story, like, I've worked hard, I've done everything I needed to do, that's why I get promoted, and then I keep basically getting the shaft, you know? Um, so I do what I can. Even with his brothers, I mean, there's an interesting part in the earlier chapters that we didn't read, is when his brothers first get that silver back, when they open the bags up and they see the silver, they're like, all of them are like, this is it. God's finally punishing us for what we did to Joseph. Like, this is, the, the, I mean, basically like God's ruling his judgment on us right now. That's how they made sense of those facts. We went, we bought grain, the guy was mean to us, we left Judah, we came back, the silver was magically in our bags. God did this, he's punishing us. They filled that square around, you know what I mean? Um, so Joseph, I think he could have easily told himself the same thing, right? When his brothers show up, and they're in need, and he's in the position of power, and his dream's coming true, they're bowing down to him, couldn't he have easily said, like, God has given me this sweet, sweet justice, you know? Like, I don't know what they called karma back then, but maybe, I mean, that's, that, that could have been the story that he was telling himself, but instead... You know, he, choose, he chose to believe that God was doing something bigger through the events of his life, to, to fulfilling a bigger purpose for him, to save many lives. Um, so I, I think that's something really cool about Joseph, is that he was able to view his life through a bigger lens. He was able to view his circumstances through a bigger lens. But here's the problem, is that we, you know, and I could tell you that. I could say, all right, so main point of the sermon, friends, brothers and sisters, is this. You should just look at your life through the bigger thing that God is doing, you know, for, for your life. I can tell you that. I can say, you know, see your life circumstances in light of God's bigger purposes. But when, when you leave, and we can write that down and it sounds great, and it is good. Like, I mean, it is point one. I don't think it's a lie. But if you walked outside, okay, and then you started living your life, you would immediately, pretty soon you'd run into a sticky situation and think, I don't know this is as helpful as I thought that it would be. And I think this is why. We're looking at the very end of Joseph's story. Right? He's four, by the way, he's about 49 years old. He was sold in this later than 18, you know, um, 18 or 19. So at this point, this is quite a few years later. He's about 49. Um, and he's at the end of his story when, when all these dots are kind of lining up. But a lot of times, that's not where we are. You know, we're, we're not in a place where we do get to see the reasons. In fact, I'd say we rarely get to really know and understand the reasons why God does the things that he does, especially in the moment. I think there are lots of things like, for example, when I was 18, when I was 18, yep, which was not that long ago, uh, I wanted to be a preacher, okay? I wouldn't have said pastor, I would have said preacher. Uh, my dad was a preacher, and I wanted to be a preacher. When I was in junior high, my youth pastor let me give a little teaching, right? And I did it, and I thought I was pretty good at it, and I loved it. And people also told me I was pretty good at it, and I loved it when they told me that. I really did. And then we, every once in a while, I don't know if, if you grew up in church, you might have had like a youth Sunday. Youth Sunday. They never, that's the word that they use in churches. I don't know if they use the youth. I don't know why they do that. Anyways, you might have had a, a Sunday where the youth got to run the service, or big church, as we called it. Yep. And uh, sometimes I would get an opportunity to preach at a big church on the youth Sunday night. Okay? And that was also fun. So I started thinking, you know what? I think this is what God wants me to do. You know, I think that he wants me to be a preacher. Uh, and so I know that all I really need now is a call, because that's what I was told. You need some kind of star, like stars align, sky opens up, and God says, like, 
Dear Paul. Or whatever he says. I don't know how he says it. I still haven't really encountered that. Uh, so, uh, you know, I figured that's what I need. And I'm just waiting on that. And then I'm going to go to Cedarville University. And I'm going to study how to be a pastor. And then I'm going to go preach somewhere. I'm going to preach all the time. Okay. And then, and, and that's like the, the, I would, you know, I had a couple dots. My dots were basically, I was a Christian. My dad was a preacher. You know, uh, I'm pretty good at preaching for someone my age. People tell me I'm pretty good at preaching for someone my age at that time, right? And I've gotten some cool opportunities to do that. So to me, it was just like, well, this looks like a preacher to me. You know what I mean? Looks like this is the story God's telling. So we're going to go to Cedarville, and we're going to do this, and we're going to get called, and I'm going to be a preacher, and I'm going to write some books, and people are going to really know my name out there. You know, so I just started filling in these dots, and then stuff started happening my senior year that was like off the, like, my mom got really sick, and then all of a sudden we couldn't really afford to send me to Cedarville. I never experienced that star, like, sky-splitting call from God to ministry, and now I don't have a, a rectangle anymore. You know what I mean? Like, my life isn't, it doesn't make sense. I have these, a few things that really threw off the plan, and that made me feel like something was wrong. Uh, you know, something was off kilter. And I, I think that we hear stories of this all the time, even for Joseph. He might have said, like, oh, well, things are great. You know, I'm born to a promised family. My, uh, you know, my dad, I'm my dad's favorite son. I got this coat. I'm having these dreams. Looks like I'm just going to be the next in the family line to go really well. And then my brother sold me into slavery. You know what I mean? So now my life isn't making sense like I thought it would make sense anymore. So... What do you do in those moments? And that's why I really hesitate to say, like, you're, the big take-home is just know the story that God's telling with your life because we don't know that. You know, we're not 18, but we're not, you know, 49 and, and at the end of that story or whatever. So we're somewhere in the middle, and most of us are closer to 18. So what do you, you know, what do you do when you get these dots that don't make sense to what you were going to do anymore? Um, and, and so that's, like, what I really want to address with these couple things, you know. And honestly, if you haven't run into this, you're going to. You're going to run into times where something happens in your life, whether it's something that happened to you or just circumstances around you or something that you made happen that suddenly throws your life off the track that you thought it was going. It suddenly throws a couple dots up there that weren't in the nice, neat, traceable plan that you thought God had for your life or the plan that you had for your life but you were calling God's plan for your life, right? And, and, so, and so what happens in those moments? I had a, I, I had a friend um, that grew up in new life with me. Uh, I think she was like a freshman at the same time I was, maybe a sophomore. And really, you know, felt, um, when, when, when I was a freshman, I really was, so, I admired so much her heart for this dream that she had specifically um, to go be a missionary in Africa. And if there was like someone in my life that I knew like at that time, that's what you're going to do. This was like her, you know what I mean? So that was just like, she, she wanted to go be a doctor in Africa, so she was pre-med, she was on that track. And then, uh, and an awesome person, by the way, not self-consumed, uh, nothing like that. Uh, but some crazy stuff happened in her life, you know, like MCAT stuff didn't turn out like she thought it would. She spent her first like full term in, uh, living abroad in a missionary context and experienced some pretty critical health issues and had to come home early. And I, I mean, I haven't got to really like sit down with her a ton, but in our couple times we've talked since then, I knew that at the time, that was like the hardest time in her life because she really, like it wasn't just like, oh, I have this idea of what I want to do and I'm not worried about what God wants me to do. It was very much like, I thought this was what God wanted. And now this stuff has happened that's thrown everything out of perspective and I don't know what I'm doing anymore. Uh, now she would, I think she would tell you, I mean, she would not say like, oh, I'm glad those times happened. You know what I mean? But she's doing, her and her husband are doing some really, really cool things right now. Um, and some of you know that. But um, anyways, all I have to say is, what do we do in those moments when the dots don't line up? What do we do in those moments when we don't understand what God is doing, but, but, but we want to be able to, to see our lives through a bigger lens? So two quick things, and this is what I would say. Uh, two things to keep in mind, okay? Uh, your second point is God always has a purpose for our circumstances. God always has a purpose for our circumstances. That's something that I think is really crucial for us to remember. Uh, there is no promise out there that says God will always 
you will always, he will always let you know what his purposes are for your circumstances. There is, that does not exist. Okay, so if you're looking for that, that's nowhere to be found. Um, in Hebrews, you know, there's this big list, the Hall of Faith is what a lot of people call it. You know, it's like, uh, when the author of the book of Hebrews, he basically walks through all these, all these people um, that, have, that are really well known for the fact that they trusted God. Many of them never saw what God promised that he would give them. You know, they never really, some of them never got to know the big purpose behind their circumstances. Um, but they trusted God through it. Because they, I, mean, I think they believed that they, he, they knew that he always does have a purpose for our circumstances. We do have that promise. A couple passages I think we're showing is Romans 8.28, which Shay actually read this morning, so that was pretty cool. Um, but Romans 8.28, do you have that one over there? Like, no, it's no big, no big deal. It says, we know that God works all things together for good for the ones who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. So we have this promise for us, for us believers, that he is always going to work things out for our good. And I've harped on people before that like misuse this verse, which happens a lot. <coughs> Again, I just always want to give this, I always want to give this little like disclaimer that if you know someone who just went through something very, very, very terrible, don't just walk up and read this verse and then no. walk away. Okay, don't do that. That's actually not helpful. That's the opposite of helpful. Okay. But something that is good to keep in mind is, the, is that, you know, like, when things happen, whether good or bad, whether happy or really depressing, that God has, a, has an ability to work through those things for your good. And our good doesn't mean our happiness. I talked about that earlier. You know, that doesn't always mean our happiness. And our good doesn't mean our short-term satisfaction, right? But our, our, our best interest and his best interest, I think, uh, he's, he's always able to work things out for the way that, that, is, that lines up for good for his better purposes. Um, another passage that I think is really helpful for this is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Uh, and this is probably familiar to some of you, but it's a really, just a really poignant verse. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, and don't rely on your own intelligence, or don't rely on your own understanding. Um, know him in all your paths, and he will keep your ways straight. I think this is really helpful because basically, you know, the point in this and really I think what we do when we don't know what's happening is just says trust in the Lord with all your heart. Um, trust in him, trust in his sovereignty, you know, Andy and I were just talking about this yesterday and um, something he's heard someone say is like God was on the throne yesterday and God's on the throne tomorrow, you know, and also today. When, some, when that thing happens that doesn't make any sense to you, God was on the throne right before it happened and the next day he'll still be on the throne. You know what I mean? So this isn't throwing off his his plans. Uh, it's just throwing off the, the plan that you were kind of making meaning of. Um, it says, don't rely on your own understanding. And I think that's really helpful, too. You know, we are naturally going to draw lines. We're naturally going to try to piece together what we think God is doing. And that is that is not a bad thing. Like, a lot of us have dreams for our lives, and we have ideas of what God's doing. That's not a bad thing. I'm not saying let go of that. You know, if you think that God's calling you to this thing, let go of it. You know, don't think about it anymore. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying when things challenge, when things push, when things don't go exactly like you would imagine they would go, like, be okay with realizing that's your understanding. You know, that's your understanding of how things should be. And you don't need to be leaning on that. You need to be leaning on the fact that God is sovereign and that he's going to work things out for your good. And he's got a good plan. Um, and just, like, this is really similar to the kind of things Andrew talked about. Um, but just knowing him and acknowledging you know, all, all your paths. Know, know, knowing him in all the details. But your relationship with God is, con you know, that's something that con consistently goes on whether things go your way or not. You know, that's something you'll always have. So I think that's how that, that lives out. Okay, so God always has a purpose for our circumstances. And that looks like trusting him to believe that, trusting in his sovereignty, and being able to let go of what you think things should look like. Okay, and the last point is that our lives are meant to be spent. And it rhymes, so you're welcome. Our lives are meant to be spent. I'm going to read just a quick one for you from Genesis 50, the last chapter of the book, and some of the last words from the story. Um, we'll start in verse probably 15 and go through about 20. Um, this is what it says. When, oh, this is right after Jacob died, by the way. So Jacob, you know, they came to Egypt, Jacob just died, and this is what it says. When Joseph's brother realized what their that their father was now dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and wants to pay us back seriously for all the terrible things we did to him? So they approached Joseph and said, Your father gave orders before he died, telling us, This is what you should say to Joseph. Please forgive me. They're so, so manipulative. You know what I mean? But anyways, they're like, your, your dad said this. You know, Your father gave us orders before he died, telling us, this is what you should say to Joseph. Please forgive your brother's sins and misdeeds, for they did terrible things to you. 
Now please forgive their sins, the servants of your father's God. And then Joseph sees through it immediately. You know, and he just sees like that they're trying still to like beg back for his forgiveness. They understand what they've done, but they just can't come out and be honest about it. So Joseph, he, he wept when he spoke to them, and his brothers wept too, and they fell down in front of him, and they said, We're here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I God? You planned something bad for me, but God produced something good from it, in order to save the lives of many people, just as he's doing today. Now don't be afraid. I will take care of you and your children. And he put them at ease and spoke reassuringly to them. So in the midst of this, you know, Joseph realized that his story really wasn't about him. That those things that had happened to him, if it was all about Joseph, and like I had mentioned earlier, if it was all about Joseph and his happiness, then this story would have had an incredibly different outcome. But Joseph realized that his life wasn't really about him. And that his life wasn't mean, meant to be spent. All of his energies and his, his, his uh, faculties weren't meant to be spent on making him happy or making him successful or climbing his way up the royal ladder but that he realized that everything he was given and everything that had happened to him was for God and God's purposes to save many lives um, and to save the lives of his family. And I think that what's really cool about that point in particular is that that uh, applies as equally, if maybe not even more equally to us um, than it did to Joseph. Um, because certainly God is still on a mission to save many lives. Um, that's, you know, that's his business. He's still on a mission to reconcile broken relationships, and he still invites us to spend our lives on that bigger cause, to view our circumstances and realize that, that the, the, the picture that he's painting is beautiful, and it's about reconciliation, it's about saving many lives, it's about something way bigger than any of us, and that we have an option to either spend our lives on us and see our life story as about us, or to realize that we're just a supporting cast and the greatest story ever told where God is the main character. Uh, I think that that's something that, you know, should really be in our hearts, should be the way that we understand our lives. But it's, it's difficult, it gets tricky. Um, there's a Fleet Foxes song that I love. I don't know if you know the Fleet Foxes, and if you don't, it's okay, but I can introduce you later. Um, but there's a lyric in there where he says, and it's, I think it's a pretty good critique of the, like, individual, individualistic culture of today anyways, but he says, I was raised up believing I was somehow unique. Yep, like a snowflake distinct among snowflakes, unique in each way you can see. But now after some thinking, I'd say I'd rather be a functioning cog in some great machinery serving something beyond me. And I just really, I have that hung up in my office, and I hung that up in my office when I was in engineering career services, and I made every engineering student look at it for a little while, because there are not a lot of hang-up Bible verses, but you can be like, what is this hipster song? You know, you should live for something bigger than yourself. <laughs> but, but I think that something really, really cool about this is that we have the same opportunity. That God's still in the business of saving lives um, through Christ, through his death and resurrection. He's trying to bring people back to him to save lives, to reconcile relationships. And through trusting him and giving our circumstances over to him, we get an invitation to be a part of that. So, uh, some things to think about. And I just wrote a couple questions. Um, and this part is in your hands, right? So, you know, I prepare a message, and we, you know, when we speak up here, we prepare a message. God, God provides a text. Um, but I think there's something that you have responsibility in, too, is are you going to think about this after you leave, or are you just going to soak it in and walk away? Which is, um, actually, it's not fine, you know? You, you shouldn't, like, hold up to the, hold up, like, looking in a mirror and seeing what you look like and walk away and never combing your hair or brushing your teeth, you know what I mean? So I want you to think about how this applies to you. I've given you, I'm going to give you a couple questions to think about that. Uh, the first one, and I'm, I'm harping on this illustration, but I'll do it again, is what is throwing off your picture right now in your life? What are those dots that just aren't fitting in? Or what, what are those dots in your past that haven't fit in? What's throwing off your picture? And the second one is what does it look like for you to trust God right now? What does it look like for you to trust God right now? Okay, so what's throwing off your picture? What does it look like for you to trust God right now? I'm inviting you, and I am telling you. Oh, wow, that's so authoritative, Caleb. It's true. I'm telling you to think about these, or write about them, or talk about them, but in some way, do something with these. Okay, don't, don't just hear and walk away. All right, I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to hang out. 
God, thank you so much for this morning again. Thank you for providing direction for our lives. God, thank you that you work all things together for our good. God, what a promise.